warning at the Mint Vitties factory. Lights are on, the ovens are running, and away we go! There I am. Anyone up for a tan? Oof, sure is warm in here. Time to cool off and check out who's looking hot. Oh, hello there. And now the moment we've waited all 30 seconds of our life for, the chocolate. Oh, we going chocolate all over my backside. Oh. <laughs> right, fall in line and a shake. Now's the time when we get suited and booted with our biscuit buddies before heading out into the big brave world. So, who fancies the biscuit? That's what I do. <laughs> I, um, I spend most of my time in factories, um, basically doing that, eating hot chocolate and digesting all the lives. So it's lots of good fun. <laughs> So who am I? Um, I love to travel. It's one of the things I really, really enjoy doing, like going <clears throat> all around the world, North America, South America, Asia, Africa, India, anywhere I go. I just love traveling. And I think actually it's a really, it's been very developmental for me actually traveling. It's really opened my eyes to the world, different cultures, different places. And um, the more I go, the more random places I end up. I get more confidence to go to some <coughs> places. Uh, I love tennis, my favorite sport. I like playing tennis. Really fortunate to beat Wimbledon this year. I went to the US Open. Love it. I love football as well. I do US support. Um, and I'm also a trustee of uh, Aspire, which is a spinal cord injury charity. So I like to um, balance a little bit by doing a bit of charity stuff and also traveling with lots of sport um, as well. My work perspective um, so I started my career at KPMG. I spent um, four and a half years there in audit. I uh, did a couple of comments at British Airport Authority. And Corporate finance, but I really wanted to get into industry. I just loved FMCG, cut me down the middle, say FMCG basically. I, just, I love that kind of product environment, factory environment, how you take all these ingredients and you put them into the products and that branded environment, things that you can identify with. And I have lots of interesting clients from lots of distilleries right through to abattoirs and animal renderers. If anyone wants the story of what it's like to be an animal renderer, I'll share it with you. We won't over food, it's pretty horrendous. Um, but, you know, I really wanted to get into the, the food and drinks industry and an opportunity came up at Heineken, uh, which was the Scottish Newcastle at the time. And that was in a commercial finance role, working in the pub division, and we literally just had our meetings in pubs and it was so much fun, it was really hard work. Loads of autonomy from you know from the word go, working with the sales teams on how do you sell your brands, get your brands into the pubs, charge uh, rents, buy new pubs, sell pubs, it was pretty cool. Um, and then a role came up at John Mendes, um, which we all know is a good, uh, good Scottish company, two divisions, airline uh, services, so you know, if you board an EasyJet flight, people who check you in, take your luggage, put your luggage on the plane, turn the plane around, clean the plane, de the plane, refuel the plane, they're all Mendes staff. Um, lot of people don't know that. And the other side is newspaper distribution, which was the complete opposite, very challenging environment to be in, and always used to remember come bonus day there, it was the most strangest place to be. So the aviation division, you walk into any airport in the world, you, know, you walk into Bogota, you walk into Mexico, win a new contract, <coughs> these guys, you know, max now getting the bonuses, the distribution division, working harder than anybody else, all they could do was cut costs, didn't get the bonuses. Who worked harder? Distribution guys. I always remember that, it was a really interesting place to be and I spent time and the best relations side, um, working on things like the stock exchange announcements, some of the media stuff, so it was quite interesting to get that external view. But I really wanted to get back into food and drink and also go somewhere else. So I moved down to London and joined United Biscuits. Working in commercial finance, again a bit like the Heineken role, and working with the sales team and then we had KP snacks at the time, so McCoy's and Hula Hoops and we sold that. And looked after customers at Tesco and Sainsbury's, which was quite interesting. Tesco actually was my uh, customer at the time when the accounting scandal happened, which was quite interesting. So um, obviously the £263 million number that you've all heard 
Uh, we were on the other side of that, which was quite interesting. So uh, lots of uh, stories to tell when we uh, had another point in time. Um, so that's a fascinating place to be. And then an opportunity then came up to go and basically work in a biscuit factory. So I um, joined the supply chain role about three years ago. Uh, and effectively I look after our supply chain finance in the UK. Uh, so manufacturing sites, logistics. And I've last four months been over in the US helping them set up the finance team. Uh, and now I'm back in the UK. So that's a bit about me. If anyone's got any questions by the way, feel free just to stop me as I go. So I was thinking about what would be two kind of defining moments that maybe shaped me in, in my career. Um, and there's two definitely stick out. One is our flooded biscuit factory in Carlisle, and I'll tell you a bit about the story. And the other is around how we really created a high performing team from not being high performing team. And I'll show that. So we'll start off with um, the great flood of 2016. So Storm Desmond swept across Cumbria, and the world's oldest <coughs> biscuit factory, so the world's oldest factory, was six feet underwater. And this is not nice water. Sewage water, this is water from the local river. It's not a great place to be. Literally water up to there. It's three floors this factory, but of course it's penetrated the whole way through. And I was working obviously in the supply chain and um, we got the call at well we knew that the floods were coming, we evacuated everybody, turned off the ovens, and, and I got a call about was it 10 o'clock the next morning, and then we assembled the crisis team to work out what to do. You know, that's one third of the entire biscuit production, 90 biscuits, stopped in an instant. Um, so my job was to lead the end-to-end -end insurance claim process, which what became the largest insurance claim in 2016 in the UK of its kind. So it was, um, it was quite a big deal. It was uh, fascinating for me. I'd never done anything like that before. I had no idea what to do. I was making it up as I went along. Uh, but it was a really great journey. And as part of that, we submitted what we did as a team, because it was an amazing team effort, um, to British Accountancy Awards, uh, and we were shortlisted and we won that, which was really cool. So we won that uh, a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to share with you the presentation that I took the judges through um, at that. So I thought that would be interesting for you to see also how we went about crafting our message for the judges on that panel. Right, so I'm going to take you to another movie, which I'm going to try and do from here this time. <laughs> Biscuit factory and one of the city's biggest employers was flooded, cutting production which is still not fully resumed. The devastation of the flood in Cumbria was all over the news, so I woke up to that and quickly phoned the team to find out we had a real problem. The site was under a metre and a half of river water. The place was surrounded by police, fire service. We talked through what had happened, where we were up to, and what the next step should be. First thing is you worry about people. Because when you hear about flooding and our employees and housing, there's this human concern about are people okay? So the whole thing was quite dramatic in terms of the speed at which the news came. That meant assembling our an agile team, they could really work quite closely with RSA to make sure that we could authorise a crew spend and really crack on as quickly as we could with the relief effort. I was one of the first people in with head torches and torches, you couldn't see a thing. It's quite key to get down there and see it for yourself because it actually brings it alive. But we set ourselves right away the target to say we would try and be up and running by early January. So it wasn't just a case of being able to go in on day one and switch all the electrics back on. Um, it took quite a long time to get electricity in place. Um, to get uh, water in place, to get sewage in place, because all of that infrastructure, that wider infrastructure, has been affected. The, the plan put in place to get the factory back up and running um, on this loss is like a critical part of the mitigation plan. We thought, well, if we get this right, and we could do it in four months. The key to our recovery was getting organised, getting structured, putting in the right resource at the right time. 
it's amazing in times of crisis you realise how important this is. Are the fact that you can't have the ginger nut and your cup of tea in a mic is just the end of the world, isn't it? <laughs> the British nation is absolutely wedded to these iconic products, so all of a sudden to have this size not able to produce it was something that was covered by national press as well as local media. Not just a how do you get your premises back in operation, but how do you get your business back to where it was. You're talking about somebody cleaning every individual nut and bolt on the machine. But it meant that they felt involved in putting that business back together. We put the Christmas lights up, see how the fucking Christmas everybody. My word, Prince John is coming to see us. It really was a, a great boost to the workforce and the community. By the first week in January, we actually had some gold bars leaving the, the, the site. In about eight weeks, we had, we had most of the lions running. What they picked out was the huge team effort. Working together as a team, um, communicating well, regular meetings, um, and just understanding the case and being prepared to put that input in um, to make it all come together. I think our service is important to Pladis because we can give them a holistic view of risk across all of their business operations. So that was a promotional video which RSE, our lead insurer, made with us and then we made them tell version of that as well but just best way to bring it to life um, is through that and, and really when this happened we, we assembled as a team and we had a couple of decisions to make about how we wanted to approach it and this happened actually 10 years ago so there was a flood in this site 10 years ago and it turned into quite a battle with the insurers which was very very difficult and it took significantly longer it took between six to nine months to get the site back up and running. Clay was on a, it's a river sits behind it. Um, and we're very significant employer. We are the largest employer in that area, employing about a thousand people directly and directly. So it was quite quite important, but it happened 10 years ago. And, and the learnings from that, we decided we wanted to do something very different. And it was all about the, the culture that we're trying to create in that team, in that environment, between all the different parties. Uh, and also about the team effort, trying to do things differently from what we did 10 years ago. So you've seen the story, um, I'll just tell you about the prequels, what happened before that. Um, so it was founded in, in 1831, so it's pretty old. Um, and back in its day, it had some of the most latest technology that you look at just now and think it deserves to be in a museum, but it was really innovative for its time. And its claim to fame was that um, cars table water ironically was served on the Titanic. Um, so that's uh, what it was like. Well, uh, the Royal Warrant, so Prince Charles lost a product, because you saw him uh, come up to the site. Um, so this is some of the some of the key sort of metrics and numbers that, that you saw in the in the film. So it was quite big in terms of the impact. So we said 40 million litres of water came in, um, and it took six JCB vehicles to take everything back out again. So it was huge. And this was one area around communication that we wanted to do really differently. So when the, when the flood hit um, as a team, so in, in that crisis management team you have everything from legal to finance, supply chain, sales, marketing, communications, and we decided that we wanted to really use social media and new types of communication methods to tell people what was going on, both in terms of our employees, but also the community. So we set up Facebook pages, we use social media to tell people, just simple things like, don't come into work tomorrow. Sounds like a small thing, but how do people know? Um, and then we want to, really to communicate with our customers to tell them what has happened. So we produce things like this, effectively we had videos and different ways of, of using latest technology to, to really bring it to life and to turn what was a crisis into a big opportunity for the site, which we're going to talk about. So who were the key characters in this, in this story? Um, so right in the middle there you have the, the, the finance crisis team. So um, I was leading that, we had a team of 10 people, amazing people we brought in to, to help us. Um, and we used all of our uh, all of our powers really try and bring everybody together to work as a team. And we brought in some experts. So we brought in our loss adjusters and our forensic accountants. And on the other side, of course, were um, Royal Alliance, so 
they were the lead insurer, but there were another number of co-insurers, so we had lots of parties. They brought in their own loss adjusters, they brought in their, their own forensics, and the meetings were quite something. So everyone has got you know, totally two different positions. We obviously want to try and get the factory recovered as quickly as possible and make sure that we limit any financial exposure. Of course, if you're the insurer, you want to obviously try and reduce any peer effectively and make sure you're not spending more money than what you need to. So these meetings were fascinating. All these massive characters in that room. It was basically, it was just like, it was like a big drama, a big play. People, you know, very verbose, people shouting, screaming, all positioning. It was, it, it was as much laughter as it was painful at times. Uh, big, big personalities. But how do you bring all those people together? And we decided from the start that we would set our position out with the insurers that they could really try and trust us. So, and we really positioned them the way we approach it. Um, very much from a few of us with an audit background, and that really helped actually. That really helped to say to our insurers, look, anything that I present to you is going to be off the standard that I would expect as, as an accountant. And that positioning right at the start really helped. And we, whilst we were obviously working for Pladis, um, we also made sure that everything that we put in front of them for them to pay back to us if, um, in cash, we were comfortable with, and it was balanced, and it was right, and it was true, and that really, really helped. And we set that up from the start, and that just built a huge amount of trust. And the team would only ever put, we would, we would never want to put anything in front of the insurers that we thought we could justify because the credibility was you had it before you know you're in a bun fight, so we wanted to avoid that at all costs. So that was how we, how we tried to operate, and uh, it was just, we, we met on a daily basis and a weekly basis um, to try and work through how you're going to try and manage the claim. And number one thing is get the factory back up and running as quickly as possible. So, you know, day one, bring in uh, specialist cleaners. Day two, start to take some of the equipment away. But every single thing had an insurance impact because before you do anything, the insurer has to prove it. The insurer has to be happy that it's at the lowest cost. So imagine if anybody's ever been unfortunate enough to maybe have a house burned down or flooded. It is a horrendous experience to go through and get everybody lined up um, and insurers drag their heels. But we, we really tried to have that, that culture that was the right culture to get the factory back up and running for the best of the business, for the best insurers, and for the best of us. So, on to the final scene. So, we got the factory up and running, as you saw there in the video, um, in record time in, in three months. Um, but of course, we clearly in a flood risk zone. And the number one question was well, is it going to happen again? And like I say, we're an incredibly important employer for Hillel and local area. And so we put together a flood defence plan uh, that we worked with various government agencies on. And it was quite political because when the flood happened in 2005, the local environment authorities or the agency was supposed to have put up flood defences for the town. Um, they clearly didn't work, obviously. Um, and we're now going back and to say, we've got a plan that we want to do for, for our side. And obviously that's got to link in harmoniously with the rest of the local environment because anything that we do might then shift flood waters elsewhere. Um, and it's not just as easy as building a wall, we have to build a wall, we have to back down the drains, all sorts of stuff because water will come in from everywhere. So we built um, flood defences. Of course this site's 150 years old, so you have to make it sympathetic with Carlisle and how it looks as well, which is a technical challenge. Um, but within six months we've got a plan out, um, we've got a brief with the local government and they provided the grant and fully paid for it, which was a, a fantastic achievement as well. And what we've done there is use this as an opportunity to really protect the site for the future. Had we not done that, then clearly our customers would have been less keen to buy some of our products. We produce cars, crackers in there, we produce some Jacob's crackers, we do ginger nuts, you know, you saw the man there that put limited to ginger nuts. People, you know, people love this stuff. So that, that's, a, that's a real challenge um, and we really want to do everything that we could protect the site for the future. Um, so the budget, what was the budget for this then? Um, <laughs> there, were, there were lots of things in there we were claiming back, so um, I'll just explain to you what that looks like when you assemble this type of uh, insurance claim. Also you need to try and recover the site, so there's a big cost in cleaning it, getting all the equipment, uh, and that goes into the, the, the millions, you know, tens of millions. Literally, I mean you are scraping down all the plasterboards, ceilings, floors, it's, it's an incredible feat. And then our reinvigoration plan, because of course our products were on the shelves. So how do you encourage our customers, so like the Tesco, etc., to take our products back on the shelves, because of course they've filled them with other products. And then to let our consumers know. So come up with a marketing plan that lets our consumers know that they're now back on the shelves again, and to go for our products when they might have had a substitute product. 
and that's quite challenging. And, and every single step of the way, of course, we wanted funding for this from, from the insurers. And you can imagine the, the discussions that went on when we said, we want a marketing plan from committees. Do you pay for it? <laughs> you know, well, is that going to benefit all your brands? Or is that just benefit brands in Kyle? Do we give you all the money? Do we give you part of the money? And you get into this massive technical argument about how much they will contribute towards it. Um, and then my role and our team's role in that was to present arguments that suggested why they should give us tens of millions for marketing plans and to support our customers. Um, and then the most technically challenging part of this was our lost profit. So we we're insured to recover any lost profit during a period of an outage. So we go back to our insurer and say, we think we would have made £100 million had there not been a flood, given £100 million. And the insurer says, well, thank you. How do you not £100 million? And then you get this massive battle um, uh, about trying to work out what do you think you would have made but for a flood. Do you, you know, does MDR forecast 100% correctly? It's incredibly technical challenging. So we had to come up with lots of quite innovative ways to show what we thought demand would have been, what supply would have been, what we would have made, what the promotions would have been if we not had the flood. And this extends out two years. So we had to work out what we think we would have made in 2018 in 2016 and asked the insurers to pay for it and incredibly challenging so we use lots of different types of um, methodologies to try and get there and actually that culture and that teamwork was really important because there isn't just one view for this and you've all got to come together and try to come to a consensus and again working with the insurers is having that credibility so when we say give us 100 million we don't laugh at you occasionally they, they actually want to work with you on getting to the right number um, and the great thing is we got you know, as far as we were concerned, like a great settlement result at the end of it, and um, with like, both the insurers were comfortable with and we were comfortable with, uh, without having to go to court, which is what happened ten years ago um, when this happened. So it got a bit, bit, bit more icy. So under the applause of this story, uh, you know, we really tried to make the most of this. We wanted to turn this into a big opportunity. This was an amazing, amazing feat by a group of hundreds of people that all got together in a massive time of crisis. We wanted to celebrate that. So. Everybody that was involved, for example, we sent them all a hand for a biscuit, so thank you note. We held a party in Kalil for all the employees that were involved. Uh, we got Prince Charles to go up and, and, and thank the people for all their efforts because uh, poor Prince Charlie didn't have his crackers, so he wanted to get back up and run. And then we applied for, for some awards and things as well. So we wanted to really make the most of this and turn this, what was a massive, massive crisis, into a really big opportunity. Just think a little bit differently, you know, don't just get into what we're going to do to try and fix the factory today. It was longer term strategy stuff, it was protect the factory for the future, get the flood defences, it was communicate well, build that local goodwill, maintain that local goodwill. Um, so we had lots of stuff and technology played a big, a big part in it as well for us. Um, and then, you know, if there was a sequel, what would happen? Um, so we really wanted to make sure we took the learnings from this and we defined what we call like an event in the box. So if, if this if happens again, we at least know how we went about it this time, both from a fully operational perspective and obviously from a, from a finance perspective. So we're, we're ready to go, but we obviously hope this, this never happens again. Um, for me personally, this was probably the number one or one of the most defining moments of my career. Just being involved in such a something so real, you know, when you go up there you, and you see that um, and the impact it's got on society because you know, biscuits are a huge part of our world, we can't supply them. Uh, the size of the numbers involved, that uh, you know, it's a thousand employees that might not have anywhere to work, who have lost their homes, and being part of that team that's trying to put this back together, uh, as quick as it can, was just, just incredible. And, and the, the team was amazing, just an amazing thing to do. And you had to be, because literally you're working 24 7 on this, literally to try, try and get through it. So that was uh, the first sort of moment. Um, well, let me move on to the next one and take questions at the end. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk to you about was um, the supply chain finance team journey. Um, very different type of story. Um, Calair was all about doing something immediately and quickly. This has been something I've been working on for about three and a half years. Um, and it's how do you bring a team that maybe don't see themselves as a team together, work together, and try and achieve great things together. And it's not easy. And it was a massive learning for me because this was the first time I was taking on a very large team, um, you know, 30, 35 people, mind your managers, multiple locations. It was a big challenge for me personally to, to, to try and step up to that. So 
we, we went through what we call high performing team journey, um, and the reason why I thought I needed this model was we weren't really a team. So um, we were so we were a finance team at each site, um, and you know, two or three people at each site. We've got a shared server centre in India, and we also have a central finance team. And when you work at these sites, you think you work in Carlisle, you think you work in Toll Cross, or you work in Manchester at your know, Betty site at your know, cars factory. You maybe only see your other colleagues once, twice a year, you don't see them, so you don't identify yourself as being a team as a supply chain finance team. But ultimately, you know, we have to get better at what we do, our systems, our processes, our ways of working. And one person at one site will not achieve as much as 30 people together trying to move mountains together and achieve something much greater. And when I took the role on uh, three and a half years ago, it took me about six months to realise really that the team weren't a team. So we had a number of team meetings. Um, <laughs> there were situations, for example, where people hadn't met each other across some of the sites that have been in for 20, 30 years. Quite, quite challenging. So um, you know, I needed some help. How, how do you resolve this? Because we, you know, technology is coming in. It's always coming in. How do you adapt? How do you have better processes? How do you adapt the way that you work? Um, and I need a team to do it. I can't do it. I need, you know, there's, I need to get a team to do it. So, um, recognised I couldn't do it alone, we brought in a team coach uh, to help me on that journey. And we defined this high performing team journey and we said, okay, there's four parts to it. You need to have really great direction. You need to have great processes. You need to really good organisational design. And you need good relationships. You have to trust each other. And that was critical because we had a team that didn't trust each other. You've got this whole people in the site, head office asking for stuff. And, it, it was, just wasn't the right type of culture, the right type of environment. So we committed to this and said, okay, we're going to spend a lot of time on this uh, to bring us together with the objective of making a world a better place, making our function a better place, having better ways of working systems, processes, ultimately so we can focus on the business partnering side, on the decision making side, and not get bogged down in kind of inefficient processes and, and doing all that together. So we all, we all got together to kick off, we watched lots of quite interesting videos, Life's About Inches, have you, have you seen that in the movie? If you know, it's a fantastic YouTube to clip, it's brilliant, it basically talks about, he's a coach, American football, um, and it's about the team all working together, steal all those inches, and eventually you make miles, and by all working together, steal those inches, you just have a transformation to get a place at the end of it. Um, there's a fantastic um, little clip there by Steve Jobs, um, about rocks, have you ever seen that? And he talks about when he was younger, um, randomly a man took him into his garage um, and in the garage there was like this tumble dryer thing and he was putting rocks in there and, out, and he was watching these rocks go round and bashing off each other and at the end of it came these really polished, polished stones and he likens his time at Apple to be like that, that he was encouraging his teams to bash off each other, a bit of conflict, a bit of friction to the end of it, something really great comes out of it. And that's a concept that we still talk about in my team today. I love a great debate. I love it when people you know, really bring a personality, don't hold back, very open, honest, give feedback. And you bash off each other, but you get something really great at the end of it. And that's something which I really try to promote in my teams is say what you think, have the debates. As long as we all trust each other, we get to a much better, better outcome. And so we all got to we we did our, our personal shield, so what, what, what's important to us, right, as individuals, what's our strengths, what's our weaknesses, at home man at work. And then as you go through that journey, you eventually start to build as a team, what does it mean? So you take all those collective values, those collective cultures, and you bring it together and say, what does it mean to be part of the supply chain finance team? Why do I go out of bed every day? Why do I want to be part of this team? And when we recruit people, we can tell them our identity, people know what it should feel like. And we spent about six months defining this. Um, we had a number of different meetings uh, to get there, because of course we all disagree. We also we all agree, actually, we all disagree. And then eventually we all, we all landed on something that we were comfortable with, that we, we, we thought we knew what our team brand was and our purpose was. And it's important this because we're all around different sites, and we all have to know that we're operating in a certain way, um, so we can try and deliver for, for the business. So we come up with this, which is, um, the team come up with this, and really we decided that to be in supply chain finance, we wanted people to feel richer in supply chain finance. That's what we wanted. And the richer could mean many different things. It could mean literally you have a conversation with us and you make more money for finance people. Or it could just mean the conversation made you feel better. So we wanted, that was what we wanted people to feel like, our stakeholders. 
uh, and our, our values, our operating, was it anything we did, we want it to be clear, so that people knew what we're talking about, it's kind of helpful. Insightful, no point just providing data, providing information, and collaborative, so the teamwork was the most important thing. Um, and this all came through the team, and, and in our team meetings now, we talk about these things. So, you know, in our quarterly meetings where everyone gets together, we'll say, so give us examples of when you think you've lived this, and if you haven't, tell us why. And if, and if we're not living it, then we need to change it. But the point is that we all need to keep talking about it and keeping it living and breathing. Um, and, you know, we've got kind of more detail that sits behind that, and I'm sharing you this is the actual presentation that, that we have in our team. Uh, so, this is what we share, and then, you know, here's some of our behaviours. So we've decided that in our team that we're going to be supportive, challenging, and proactive. That's the, the three behaviours that we think are important as part of our team that we've all come together. Um, support is important because one site might be having difficulties and other site not. So how do you help each other out? Um, some, one person might be leaving early, one person leaving late. How do you help each other through that? Challenge is important because back to Steve Jobs and his rocks, you have a bit of that and actually you get something much better at the end of it. And, and proactive, and, and I think having that positive energy is important, and, and being proactive, doing something, making it happen is, is quite important. Whenever, whenever I recruit, I always look for two things. People who are curious, and people who are proactive. And I think if you've got those two things, that curiosity and that proactivity, then you just go on to do amazing things. And, and then we've obviously got a mission and that type of thing as well. So that's probably two experiences, really, that I wanted to share with you today. Um, that have probably defined me and my crew, who I am. And, you know, Kaleo, I say, was about big operational challenge, com complex stakeholders, and that amazing part of the team and doing things a bit differently, thinking strategic, thinking longer term, um, and then how the Splashy Finance team and how do we bring that team together and really create that culture and, and that vision. And that's probably two things which, you know, will live with me forever and I'll take into any of my future roles about that team culture and um, working, working together with this one. That's what I wanted to share.